Hi everyone, welcome back. So remember the work the book that we're reading this week is called Other Words for Home. So we are now on part two of the book and it is titled Arriving. Let's go ahead and get started. The plane flight is long. Our seats are near the back of the plane. Mama pressed against the window and me pressed against her. While Mama sleeps, I look out the window. When the sun rises, I can see the ground below. It all looks so tiny and far away. I gasp, but no one hears me. From the window of the plane, I see a muddy river framed by green rolling hills that are dotted with houses. I wonder which of those houses will now be mine. We arrive in a city that I cannot pronounce, a city called Cincinnati. When the plane lands, Mama and I are quickly directed to a long line. For people like us, people who are not from America, but who are trying to enter. The line moves slowly, my eyelids feel heavy, and my body does not have any idea what time it is. It is finally our turn. We are called up to talk with a man sitting in a booth under a sign that says, Immigration. The man beckons for us to step up closer. He has kind blue eyes that seem tired. Everyone in this airport airport seems tired. He starts talking and I know some of the words that are coming out of his mouth, but my mind feels sticky and I can't quite catch the meaning. Back home, I was always good at English. I was one of the best in my class at having pretend conversations. I think of practicing simple phrases with Fatima right before I left. I think of how easy they came to me then. How are you? Good, thank you. Are you hungry? Would you like to go to lunch? I would like a sandwich, please. But this man is not asking me simple things like if I am hungry or what I would like to order. He is asking real questions that I can barely understand like, why are you here? And how long do you plan on staying? I glance at my mama and her newly swollen stomach. And I know this, is, this part is my responsibility. I am the one who knows English. I am the one who needs to talk, but I am failing. Words, all kinds of them, bubble up in my throat, but nothing comes out. Mama reaches into her purse and hands the man an envelope. We watch as the man opens the envelope and I looks through the documents. He studies each one as though it were a precious artifact and every organ in my body holds its breath as I watch him make up his mind about us. Your uncle lives here, he asks me, giving me one more chance to prove myself. You are coming here to visit him? Yes, I say, yes, yes, yes. It is clear as crystal. Relief bubbles up inside of me. One word in English, but it seems to be enough. The man stamps our paperwork. Welcome to America. Chapter three. We are lucky. I know this because Mama tells me over and over again as we walk down the narrow hall toward baggage claim. Mazazine, Mama whispers under her breath, and I know she is referring to the fact that her papers worked, that we are not still stuck in that line, that we were not sent back. It is so strange to feel lucky for something that is making my heart feel so sad. Chapter four. My uncle is not what I was expecting. He has tailored suits and a fancy wristwatch. He has perfect English and a big car that purrs as it hums down the street. He meets us at the airport with his wife, my aunt Michelle, and their daughter, my cousin Sarah. When he sees my mother, his whole face lights up. He has my mother's smile. He has her eyes, my eyes. My mother rushes to him and I feel her exhale as he wraps his arm around her and something inside me twists. I don't want my uncle to think that we needed saving. I don't want to owe him anything. I cross my arms over my chest to show them, my uncle, his wife, his daughter, that I am not a straight animal they need to adopt. But my resolve starts to fade when his wife walks toward me and clasps my hands in hers. Welcome to America, she says. 
Her voice sounds like an American movie star, clear and sprinkled with sugar. She looks like an American star too. Honey blonde hair, big light eyes, casual elegance. Call me Aunt Michelle. We're so glad you've come to visit us. She is looking at me, telling me not to worry, that I don't owe them anything. I smile at her and find my words in English. Thank you. My uncle drives us back to his house, which is in the neighborhood called Clifton. Clifton is easier to say than Cincinnati. Clifton, I practice saying, and my cousin Sarah laughs. She has barely said anything but hello to me, and now she is laughing, laughing at my English pronunciation. Sarah, Aunt Michelle says, and I hear the warning in my aunt's voice. That is something powerful enough to transcend oceans, a mama's ability to say something without actually saying it. I don't like this about myself, but the more I look at my cousin, my cool American cousin, with her jean shorts that are purposefully ripped, a sequin t-shirt, and pale pink lip gloss, the more I want to be like her, the more I want her to like me. But from the way she is staring out the window, pretending like I don't exist, I get the feeling that she doesn't care much whether or not I like her. Chapter six, my uncle's house is so big that it could fit four of my old apartments inside of it. It has three whole stories and shiny wooden floors that creak when you step on them. My uncle Mazin works all the time. He is an important doctor at an important hospital. So during the day, it is just Aunt Michelle, Mama, Sarah, and me. Our first few days in America are a blur of mornings that feel like nights and nights that feel like mornings. Plates of baked chicken and pasta, bowls of milky cereal, and lots and lots of questions from Aunt Michelle. No matter how tired we are, Aunt Michelle forces us to get up and get out. We take long walks around our new neighborhood. Aunt Michelle charges ahead. Mama and me are sandwiched in the middle and Sarah walks slowly behind us, sulking a little. I keep expecting to see a cliff in Clifton, but so far, I've only found really big hills and even bigger trees. Clifton is filled with old big houses. Aunt Michelle tells us that their house is over 100 years old, and I can tell she is proud of this, but I'm not sure why. Everyone back home wants a new house, not an old one. When I ask Mama about it, she says, Americans don't have much history, so they like things they think are old. At first, I don't think I will like the old house with its creaking wooden floors and steep staircases. Mama and I live up in the bedroom on the top floor, the third floor. But one morning when I wake up, the floor creaks and it sounds like the house is saying hello and that makes me feel less alone. The old house is slowly becoming my friend, my first American friend. Chapter seven. When my uncle is home, he is always asking if we are okay or does mama need a glass of water? I know he means to be nice, but it only makes me feel more like a guest in his house, a visitor, a burden. Come here, Jude, he says in English. Even though I know he speaks Arabic, he always speaks to me in English. He invites me into his study and shows me his speakers that can play music without any wires and his shiny computer with its big flat screen. I know he wants me to be impressed and I am, but I try to hide it. Showing him I'm impressed feels somehow like a betrayal of Baba, a betrayal of home. Chapter eight. My cousin Sarah is chunky platform sandals that clomp clomp on the hardwood floors of the old house. She is sparkly pink lip gloss and nails the color of a sunset on a summer night and jeans that have shiny sequins on the pockets. Sometimes she is friendly, inviting me to sit next to her on couch where she watches a television show about American teenagers who wear fancy clothes and are trying to figure out who murdered one of their classmates. I tell Mama about the show. 
Americans are obsessed with murder, she says. And you made me move here to be safe, I say, half joking, half not. Mama shakes her head and tells me to stop watching. But the very next afternoon, I sit next to Sarah on the sun-soaked white leather couch and watch the American teenagers play detective. Sarah is less than a year older than me, but I feel like she is already a woman, while I am still a little girl. She doesn't seem surprised by all the kissing on the show. I wonder if she has been kissed herself, but I am not brave enough to ask her. I start to think that Sarah is becoming my friend, but one night I hear her talking with Aunt Michelle. When will they leave? Sarah says. My heart sinks a little as I translate the words in my head, the weight of them slowly settling onto my chest like a stone. She can't go to my school, Mom. Sarah says. She doesn't even speak English, she says. I spend the rest of that night locked in the bathroom, whispering to myself in the mirror, I speak English. Chapter 9. America is full of new things. Glittery, blinking in your face things. Everything in America moves fast and is loud. Cars honking, traffic lights flashing, big billboards advertising hamburgers, drinks, and entirely new life. It seems like everything, everyone, is trying to sell you something. Sometimes I feel dizzy with want. Sometimes I just feel dizzy. Aunt Michelle takes us shopping at a mall that feels like it is larger than my entire town back home. When I say this to Mama, she scoffs and tells me our town is not that small. But when she doesn't know I'm looking, I see her eyes fill with wonder as she takes in the cold, air-conditioned stores, each one bigger, fancier than the last. In America, it seems like everyone has money. New shiny sneakers, bright colored lipstick, pants that fit just right. Then, I start to notice the man on the corner with the sign begging people for help. The tired woman waiting for the bus with shoes that are cracked at the sole. America, I realize, has its sad and tired parts too. America, like every other place in the world, is a place where some people sleep and some people, other people, dream. Chapter 10 Sometimes I think I might split in half from the ache of missing my brother, Baba, Fatima, Auntie Amal, the ocean, Ches Mariana, fruit that tastes like sunshine. I even miss the tourists and sometimes I even miss the smell of fish. Sometimes it feels like when I boarded that plane to fly to America, I left my heart behind, beating and lonely on the other side of the ocean. I talked to Baba through my Uncle Mazin's fancy computer. The first time we call him, I sit in my mama's lap while my uncle presses buttons that make the computer come alive. And all of a sudden, Baba is on the screen. Both mama and I squeal with delight. We tell him about the old house and the even older houses on our street. We tell him about the big trees that stretch up high in the sky and the big hills and the big cars that we see driving down the street. Everything is big in America? He asked, smiling. Baba is smiling so big, it makes me think, if only for a second, that everything is going to be okay. That someday soon we'll all be together again. Mama asks him about the store, and he says everything is good, but his smile fades. Until now, I never knew you could see fear through a computer screen. Baba says our town is safe, but there are still protests and there are still tanks nearby in nearby towns. When he talks about the protests and the tanks in nearby towns, we all tense and my heart is thinking, where is Isa? Do you see him? Do you miss him? But my mouth is silent. My lips shut like a closed door. When Baba ends the call, and it's just Mama and me left in Uncle Mazin's study, I ask Mama about Isa. Her big eyes go sad. She kisses my face and tells me not to worry. But it's hard to do that when I can see and smell the worry all over her. Chapter 11. 
Aunt Michelle wears her hair in a long, loose braid and has a band of bracelets that jangle on her wrists when she walks. She shows me how to use the dishwasher, an appliance we did not have home, and how to use the microwave. 30 seconds to defrost a piece of frozen bread, approximately two minutes to reheat a dinner plate. I love the way Aunt Michelle greets me every morning with a plate of pancakes, the way she speaks slowly so that I can understand her, and always smiles like she understands me, even though when I know my accent is thick and I have put the words in the wrong order. I love how she shows me all the flowers in her garden, pointing each one out and saying its English name slowly. Rose, tulip, marigold. Mama is not sure about Aunt Michelle, but I already feel comfortable gliding around barefoot in her kitchen. Singing along with her to an old Whitney Houston song, she tells me that I can always put on any song that I want. All I have to do is ask. Aunt Michelle's old house is washed with sun. She leaves all the windows open and is decorated with white pillows, white chairs, and white couches. Too much white, Mama says. Boring, Mama says. Once I hear Mama ask Uncle Mazin, I don't see anything from home here. Uncle Mazin turns to her and says, this is home. Chapter 12. Aunt Michelle loves anything French. She studied French literature at a university where she met my uncle. He says he fell in love with her the moment he saw her. Aunt Michelle shakes her head when he says this, but her face turns red and she looks so happy that I know she believes him. Mama also shakes her head at this story. Aunt Michelle pretends not to notice, but I know she does. Mama says, she's too American. I say, she is American. Mama says, she doesn't speak a word of Arabic. I say, why would she? She's American. She says, she has made Mazin forget his home. I want to say this is his home now, but I look at Mama's belly and don't say anything. Chapter 13. Aunt Michelle takes Sarah and me out to lunch at a French restaurant. We eat sandwiches on baguette bread. Aunt Michelle and Sarah get their sandwiches with ham, and I want to, but then I think of Mama, all alone in Uncle's house, and what she would think if she saw me eating ham, and I order just cheese and tomato. Back home, food was rice, lamb, fish, hummus, pita bread, olives, feta cheese, za'atar with olive oil. Here, that food is Middle Eastern food. Baguettes are French food, spaghetti is Italian food, pizza is both American and Italian, depending on which restaurant you go to. Every food has a label. It is sorted and assigned. Just like I am no longer a girl, I am a Middle Eastern girl, a Syrian girl, a Muslim girl. Americans love labels. They help them know what to expect. Sometimes, though, I think labels stop them from thinking. What do you think, Aunt Michelle asks, when the dessert comes? It is a chocolate tart. It is delicious. I look around the restaurant at the stiff white linen tablecloths, at the framed pictures of the Eiffel Tower, at the servers wearing pinstriped pants. It's very French, I say. I wonder if the words that come out of my mouth make any sense at all. Aunt Michelle and Sarah smile, and that's when I know I am finally speaking a language that they understand. Chapter 14. The night before the first day of school, a storm breaks across the sky. I watch the lightning streak and the thunder boom from the window on the third floor. I press my face up against the glass and say, American storms are so strong. The wind bends the tree and there is a hiccup of fear in my chest but the trees stay strong. We have storms back home, Mama says. She is lying in her bed, her hands propped on her belly, which is growing larger every day. Mama always does this. If I say I like something, if I'm impressed with something in America, she reminds me that we have the same thing back in Syria. I usually ignore her, but tonight, it is like the storm is inside of me too, and I'm tired of being quiet. 
Don't you want me to like it here? I am tired of being the tree in the wind that is always pushed but never allowed to fall down. Of course, she says. I walk over to the bed and hoist myself up into the mattress. Mama wraps her arms around me, pulling me close to her. And she smells like she always has. Art agar wood oil and rose water. It is the smell of home, of love, of safety. It is a smell that makes me feel like it is okay for me to say anything. Why did you bring me here? I ask. The same question I'm always asking, but I'm never getting a satisfactory answer to. You know why, Habibdi, Mama says, and she sounds so tired. And I almost decide to drop it, but then the thunder booms and I feel like, and I feel it in my chest and I say, it's like you want me to hate it here. Of course I don't, but you always tell me things are better at home. I am scared you will forget. If you don't want me to forget, we shouldn't have left. Mama takes my face in her hands and she pulls me centimeters from her and it feels like we are sharing one breath. Don't you see? I know you will have a better life here, but that breaks my heart. You are too young to understand, Jude, but someday you will. Lightning cracks across the sky and I lean against her and she accepts my weight, pulling me into her arms. All right, you all, so that's it for part two. Make sure you check in next week for part three. Thanks for joining.